Each week, True Crime Files of Los Angeles takes a case and we examine the facts of that case from the crime scene to the investigation phase, the apprehension of the suspect, as well as the trial, what happened uh, in the courtroom and what happened after the trial. Today's case is the Roman Polanski case. And I think you're gonna find it very fascinating because uh, it's gonna divide the audience in half. Some of you are gonna think of him as a child predator and some of you are gonna think of him as a great film director. All of it started back in 1977 when he decided to do a film shoot uh, for Vogue magazine. He decided to use a 13 year old girl and he took her up to Jack Nicholson's house on Mulholland Drive in the Hollywood Hills when Jack Nicholson wasn't there. And he gave her some drugs and some alcohol and got her in the jacuzzi and then some sexual acts occurred. Later on, the mother found out about it and the mother went to the police and the police arrested and charges were filed against Roman Polanski uh, for what he did to that 13 year old girl. He was afraid of going to state prison and his attorney worked out an agreement where he would only have to serve 90 days in prison. But the controversy revolves around he didn't serve 90 days, he only served 47 days. And then the word got out, maybe the judge was going to send him to prison for a long period of time. And he got on the next airplane and he flew to France. He's been on the run for 45 years and really is considered the most famous fugitive of all times. So let's get into the facts and you listen to them. And at the very end, you make your own decision. Is Roman Polanski a child predator or is he merely a great film director? You decide. Well, what is our topic today? Roman Polanski, child predator or talented film director? Which is it? Two separate questions there. But we do know for certain that he's the world's most famous fugitive. Why is that? Well, we've got to go back to the date of 1977 uh, regarding a photo shoot for Vogue magazine. And here's the cover of Vogue of Farrah Fawcett Majors was on the cover of it in 1977. And Vogue said, hey, you know, Roman, you know, you have an eye for things that are different. So we want you to try to do a photo shoot that would be new, refreshing. And he's thinking about, now where could I do it? And he said, I'll, I'll do it. But he wants a place that would be perfect for it. And he's thinking of his friend, um, Jack Nicholson. They had done a movie together called Chinatown back in 1974. Uh, Roman was the director, Jack Nicholson was the actor. And they developed a very close friendship as well as many times uh, Roman was invited up to Jack's place on top of Mulholland Drive. Uh, beautiful, beautiful place up there. And what is it, the advantage of it, it's a very private place. It's a gated area. And he says to Jack, you know, can I borrow your place? Can I uh, do a photo shoot there? We're going to be gone for a week. You can have the place. You can do a photo shoot whenever you want. It's all yours. And Roman goes, that's just great. And the, the appealing thing about it is up on top, you have a beautiful view of downtown Los Angeles, as well as the San Fernando Valley. Very appealing place, very private place. Now, what is going to be the subject matter of this photo shoot? You know, Vogue generally has very attractive women on the cover and articles about attractive women, but they want something different. And he's trying to think of what would be something different. And he thinks about maybe some young girls, maybe some, a photo, photo shoot of young girls. And so on March 10th, 1977, you know, he's thinking, okay, I'll do this. Now he's 43 years old. And he gets a model who's 13 years old, a young girl. And he picks her up and drives her up to Jack Nicholson's place on top of Mulholland Drive. And he wants to set the right mood, the mood setting. And so he has some qualudes. Now qualudes 
were kind of the party drug of the 1970s. They were called the biscuit, bit disco biscuits. And the purpose of them, they were to release the user's sexual inhibitions. Um, I guess they'd be called a date rape drug back in the 70s. And he also bought, uh, brought along with several bottles of champagne. And, you know, champagne is used to increase the sex drive of the foreplay, especially the longevity of intercourse. So he has both of them and he gives them to the 13 year old so that she can mellow out and be ready for this photo shoot. So talk about the situation on top. Uh, they're in the back on this decking area of the pool. Um, as I say, a beautiful view from there of Los Angeles looking out. And uh, on the other side, there's a jacuzzi. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But here, you can see a picture uh, of the young girl. She's there on the photo deck. She has a bikini on uh, out in the sun there. And then there's another, here she is by the jacuzzi. You can see the San Fernando Valley in the background. She has kind of an open blouse there. So uh, Polanski is taking a number of different pictures of her uh, in different settings and mainly with her bikini on. And then the idea was how to remove some of this clothing uh, so we can take additional photos. They get in the jacuzzi. And here's a picture of her in the jacuzzi with her clothes off. Uh, and he gets in with his clothes off and they kind of frolic around inside there um, for a while and then he gets closer to her and he starts touching her and there is uh, sexual activity uh, comes up from behind her and there's uh, various sexual acts that are committed on her in the jacuzzi now this goes on for you know, maybe a half hour, maybe 45 minutes or so. And at some point, you know, she stands up, gets out. She looks for a towel to wrap herself in. And then she walks into uh, the bedroom area uh, and he follows her, follows behind her. And then he comes up and he starts touching her from behind. And she says, no, no, no. And then up next to the bed, you know, she sits down on the bed. And he asked her a question, are you on the pill? And you know, she recognized what that was all about. And she said, no, no, I'm not on the pill. And you know, she gets up and then she walks into the bathroom area and he follows her into the bathroom area. And he said, oh, don't worry, that's gonna be okay. I'll just sodomize you then. And she doesn't respond. She doesn't say anything. Uh, she doesn't say no, doesn't say yes. and. He then follows her back into the bedroom and um, she is pushed down on the bed and he starts uh, having sexual acts with her. Many sexual acts of intercourse, uh, sodomy, oral copulation, and takes pictures, takes all sorts of pictures of her. Now this goes on for uh, several hours uh, to the point where she she's had enough and she says, okay, I think I need to go home. I, I think I need to get going. And he's okay. And he picks up his camera, the camera equipment, and leaves Jack's place in his car and drives over in the direction of her house in the San Fernando Valley. And as they're driving there, he says, you know, uh, you're not going to tell her anybody about, you know, what we did up at Jack Nicholson's place. She said, no, 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 no. I'll never tell anybody about that. It's a secret. He says, fine, fine, you know, that's, that's okay. Now, as he drops her off, uh, her mother comes out and she comes over to the car and uh, Polanski says, oh, she did great on the photo shoot. It was great. And, and I'm gonna wanna do another photo shoot with her. Uh, she's very good at this. And the mother says, that's great. Uh, let me see a date that's convenient with her and you and we'll get it all set up. And Jack says, yeah, I'll give you a call. I'll give you a call. And that was it, and he drives off. Now, what happens next? Oh, it might be about two hours later. Uh, the 13-year-old girl is on the phone. She's on the phone. She's talking to a girlfriend of hers. And 
they're talking back and forth and then she's starting to tell what happened at this photo shoot and then what happened at the jacuzzi and all the touching and all the sexual contact and then what happened in the bedroom she goes into detail about it now what she doesn't know is her sister is at the door listening and overhearing everything that she is explaining to the person on the phone then when the phone call is over the sister sneaks down sees the mother and as a tattletale tells the mother everything that he that she has heard um, the 13 year old to say the mother listens to that the first reaction is she doesn't believe it she thinks no that was just made up and she really questions it and then she calls uh, the 13 year old to come down to talk to her and she starts asking her questions and she explains all the sexual uh, acts that were committed and the mother listens to them and she is just livid she she grabs the phone and she calls LAPD to report it. she says my my daughter has been sexually molested and I said okay you know bring her in let's take it on a report so they go to the police department they take a police report they have a rape kit um, and they take samples from her uh, so they do a complete investigation and then they interview her and she tells the story of what happened you know she doesn't hold back um, and so they talk to Polanski and you know he's surprised by it that, you know, anybody said anything so he kind of gives a different version as to what happened he said yeah well, there was a photo shoot but his version is that you know he's being framed you know you know that mother has set me up you know she sent her daughter you know to do this photo shoot with me and it, she's making it look like a casting couch situation uh, and it wasn't and now she's trying to extort money from me well they do their report complete it all and uh, they take it over give it to the district attorney's office well the district attorney's office then takes it to the grand jury and they have her come in and testify in front of the grand jury now it's private there are no spectators in there when she testified to the grand jury and the grand jury comes back with this indictment and the charges in the indictment are rape by drugs supplying drugs to a minor sodomy and oral copulation so these are the charges that she uh, he is indicted on and as a result of that uh, uh, the uh, proceedings continue now he is arrested and he is booked uh, for all these charges and he bails out now what happens next is it goes public you know and there's a tremendous amount of pressure on uh, the mother and the media makes the mother look uh, like she's an extortionist you know what mother would allow a 13 year old to go on a, a photo shoot by herself without any supervision you know no decent mother would do that and they make the victim look like a liar she's made this up uh, they're just trying to get money from a celebrity so after a while the family comes to the DA's office and says look you know we don't want her testifying in a courtroom in, in the public we don't want any more of this we want you to drop the charges uh, just end it so now this gets us to a case settlement situation between the defense and the prosecution on the defense side Roman Polanski did not want the public to know about all the things that he had done to a 13 year old uh, up at Jack Nicholson's place he didn't want this to go public so it doesn't want it to go to trial on the other hand the prosecution was under tremendous pressure from the victim's family they did not want her to testify and they wanted anything done to make the case disappear so as a result of that Roman Polanski agreed to plead guilty to a lesser charge of unlawful sex with a minor so this seemed like this would be a perfect way to end it for both of them and the sentence would be decided later on but the condition was that he would be sent uh, for a 90-day diagnostic study at state prison 
So this was what was worked out. He would go to a state prison. They would do a final report, and then he would be sent back to the court, and then the court would do the sentencing. Now, what happened was when he went out to Chino State Prison, uh, he did what he was told to do. Uh, he was like any other inmate. He was uh, treated like a prisoner. But what happened was he was released after 47 days. He did not serve the 90 days that he was supposed to. The report was made and he was released. Now what happened as a result of that, Judge Rittenman heard about it. He got the word that there was an early release. He was a judge who, when he said 90 days in state prison on a diagnostic, it was 90 days. You were not to be released early. So then there's some talk about, well, you know, he's going to have to serve the remaining time or go to state prison. Now, because of that confusion, uh, we don't know how Roman Polanski heard about that the judge was thinking about somehow he was going to have to go back to state prison. But he, he learns that Polanski does not want to spend another day or night in state prison. So, for whatever reason, he gets this idea, I'm going to leave town, and he did. He got on the first uh, plane and he flew out of Los Angeles to Paris, France. He knew if he got to France, he would be safe because France would not extradite him on these types of charges. Uh, child molesting. So he was safe as long as he stayed in France. Uh, now he goes on for many years, uh, you know, on the, as we say, on the lam as a fugitive. Now he became a fugitive for many, many, many years. And why it was interesting was there was a TV series back in 1963 to 67 called The Fugitive. Uh, Dave Jansen was the actor in that very, very popular uh, TV series. And then eventually Harrison Ford in 1993 did a movie, The Fugitive. And it was all based on a doctor who was accused of killing his wife. And he didn't want to get arrested because he wanted to find out who the killer was. Uh, so he, he constantly was on... Uh, the move to find the killer and the police were always trying to track him down. So he was a fugitive. And so here Roman Polanski uh, is tagged a fugitive as well. Now, Roman Polanski, uh, people have very strong feelings about him, either for him or against him, uh, for various reasons. And we want to examine that. And in order to understand that as to who Roman Polanski is, we have to look at his background. Well, his childhood. He was born in Paris, France in 1933. Um, and this is his real name, Liebling. And his father was Polish Jew, uh, which is going to be important. And his mother was a Russian Catholic. Interesting combination between the two of them. So he kind of started growing up in France, but his parents decided to move to Poland in 1937 was not a smart move on their part because the Germans uh, were coming in there and the Nazis were taking over Poland. So what happened to them, since the father was Jewish, the family had to pick up everything and move to the Krakow ghetto. And that's where uh, Roman Polanski is going to spend a number of years at this ghetto. And eventually his mother is shipped out of there and is sent to Oswald uh, concentration camp where she eventually died and his father fortunately he survived but he went to the Austria, Austrian concentration camp. Now as far as Roman uh, he was able to escape from the ghetto and he hooked up with a uh, Polish Catholic family. They had a farm outside of Warsaw so he lived with them uh, all those years and he was safe. Now after the war was over, he wanted to go to film school, and he did. He enrolled at the Polish Film School at Lotz, uh, and he did very, very well. He learned everything about filmmaking, and he graduated in 1959. 
and he was very talented. He could speak many different languages. Uh, so he was doing very well, and it did his first movie. It was called When Angels Fall in 1959. Now, the star of his movie was Barbara Lass, uh, very attractive, and she was only 15 years old, and he marries her after the movie was over. So they lived together after that for some time, and he continued to make more movies. And one of them, 1965, Repulsion, uh, got a lot more attention. Because uh, Catherine Demenu was in it, she became a very famous uh, French uh, film star. So, got a lot of notoriety. But it wasn't until uh, The Fearless Vampire Killers in 1967, with Sharon Tate, when that came out, uh, he got a lot of attention uh, on this. So he did this movie, uh, and they got to know each other quite well uh, as a result of that. And it went on. Uh, they started dating after the movie and became quite a couple, uh, quite a noted couple uh, in the movie business. And they moved to London and spent they even had a, a flat in London uh, where they lived for several years. Then in 1968, they married. They married and were very, very happy over in London. However, he was doing a number of movies in Hollywood. So he decided to come to Hollywood and to rent a house. And this is the house they rented uh, on top of the hill. Uh, beautiful view from up there of the city of Los Angeles. He really had, he had made. He was living at the top of Hollywood. Uh, what else could he ask for? So things were going very, very well for him. And we're going to take the date of August the 8th, 1969, which is going to change everything in his life. Sharon Tate is very, very heavy with child. Now, Roman Polanski is over in Europe, finishing up some of the locations for a movie. And she has just flown home. So she's home. Uh, with her friends. These are her friends uh, and they're having a pool party. They have a wonderful time. It's hot. It's August. She's very heavy with child. So afterwards they go to a Mexican restaurant, have a nice dinner, uh, and they all come back uh, to the house and they're all staying at the house with Sharon. So she has people with her. And what is going on that they don't realize is going on that Charles Manson is trying to create a revolution between the blacks and the whites, and he calls it Helter Skelter. And the idea is the blacks would take over and the whites, uh, you know, would have to look to, for somebody and they would look to Manson to save them. Now, the problem with it is that he wanted it to look like the blacks were killing white people. And he knew that if he sent some people over to the Hollywood Hills, and this is some of the people from the Manson family, these are his followers, they go to the Tate house where Sharon Tate is living and they go in there, they attack the people and kill them in a vicious way. And here uh, Jay Sebring and Sharon Tate are killed in the living room. Now he is shot once and then they go over and stab him uh, numerous times. But what was you know, really bad. They took Sharon, who's uh, almost eight and a half months pregnant, and they stab her uh, in the stomach area 16 times, killing her as well as the fetus. Then they grab it around her neck and they uh, string her up, uh, the two of them, uh, over a beam in the living room. And that's the, uh, the rope that was used. Now, as to the other two that were in there, Abigail Folger and Mikowski, uh, they were able to escape. They ran out, but the girls chase after them and catch both of them and stab them on the front lawn. Now, she's stabbed 28 times, and Fikowski, he is stabbed 51 times and shot several times as well. So that's what happened at the Tate house. The next morning, the housekeeper wakes up and finds all these dead bodies. The police, the coroner come over, and this became the uh, Tate 
shooting and killing and uh, Charles Manson is prosecuted for that and all of them are found guilty of the killing of Sharon Tate and the others as well as another uh, so this whole thing was devastating to Roman Polanski I mean here he is the next day he flies in and there's Sharon Tate's blood on the uh, front step of the house and then on the front door they've written the word piggy in Sharon Tate's blood just think of how all of this affected uh, Roman Polanski it had an impact on him for the rest of his life now that is what happened regarding the Manson matter now let's go on with his career the accomplishments that he had with filmmaking uh, we've talked about Chinatown and the tenant so he had a number of very very uh, big movies and this one Tess in 1979 is important in what we're talking about it's about a young girl very young and how she is treated uh, in the community and I find these words very interesting about the case uh, and Sharon Tate was the one that had recommended to Roman Polanski that he do this movie Tess and he does this after her death but look at the words she was born into a world where they called it seduction not rape what she did would shatter that world forever you kind of think of our young model you know they want to call it, maybe it was just seduction but it wasn't really rape well it depends how you look at things now we go on with his life uh, now uh, Signer who is she she is very important because he marries her in 1989 and you can see the age difference uh, he's 56 she's 23 quite a bit younger now what was her background well she was an actress she was a singer very talented she would have been three years old when Sharon Tate was murdered she would have been 11 years old when our model was sexually assaulted by Rowan Polanski in 1977 uh, so quite a bit younger and um, she did a number of movies uh, and he directed them and she became very very uh, popular for these movies that she made one with Harrison Ford frantic so that's a little bit about who Roman Polanski marries and his life that he takes with her and they have children now but he continues to be on the run he is traveling back and forth between France and Poland he can go to those two countries because they will not extradite him back to the United States uh, on these charges so back in 1988 uh, he was traveling to Canada to win an award uh, on a film festival uh, in Toronto so it was a big thing he was going to be honored and I learned about it and I was in charge of one of my um, uh, responsibilities was all extraditions for the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office so when I hear that he's going to be flying to Canada I know that I can get the Canadians to uh, arrest him as soon as he lands there so I alert the Mounties that he is flying there and he's going to come uh, the day before the festival so I have everybody up in Toronto waiting for his flight to come in and his flight comes in uh, but he's not on the flight somebody somewhere along the line had tipped him off and he didn't get on the plane he was not there so we could not arrest him since uh, he had not left France now his career continues he does a lot more directing and he did one of the penis in 2002 very well received uh, movie it was about a Jewish pianist and how he escaped uh, he went into the ghetto uh, it was kind of a takeoff on 
Roman Polanski. Instead of being a pianist, he was a director. Uh, so very, very popular, and he won a number of awards as far as Oscars. <clears throat> he got, uh, Roman Polanski got the Best Director Award for Pianist, and it won other Oscars as well, screen uh, play. Uh, but he couldn't come to the United States to accept the award. Somebody else had to receive the Oscars for him. You know, you think of all that he had done and he wasn't able to reap the benefit of it. Now, by 2008, uh, there was a TV series that uh, was made. It was called Roman Polanski, Wanted and Desire. And it goes into uh, Judge Rittenban and it talks about the prosecutor on the case, as well as the defense attorney, and about the victim. And it has interviews with each one of them, uh, not the judge because he had passed away, but went into great detail uh, and how he was not being treated fairly. Now the victim came out and she did an article and she did that uh, TV series and she wanted to forgive and forget. Now she had got married, she had had three children, uh, she moved to Hawaii. What was interesting about her background, uh, she brought a civil lawsuit against Polanski to any proceeds from his films and somehow that case got settled and it was never disclosed how much. The word is uh, we can't prove one way or the other that she got there's seven hundred thousand uh, dollars in a uh, settlement as a result of that she became his biggest supporter uh, he want she wanted all the charges to be dropped against the, she doesn't want any proceedings to continue against Roman Polanski uh, okay now what happened in 2009 he is getting an award in Switzerland for filmmaking. It's kind of the same thing that happened in uh, Canada, but this time he went to Switzerland. He goes there to receive the award. He felt that he would be safe to do that because he, he thought he could trust the uh, Swiss. But he's arrested. He's arrested as soon as he uh, was there. So after 31 years on the run, he's finally arrested. So that seems like that's going to be, no, it isn't the end of it. There were all sorts of uh, protests that were made. Free Polanski, free Polanski, uh, free Roman. Thousands of people came out in support of him that he should not be prosecuted. Uh, so the pressure was put on Switzerland. And this is kind of interesting. We, Woody Allen come, comes out and says, you know, you know, they shouldn't pursue any further uh, crimes against, just because he's arrested for child sex charges. Nothing, there's nothing wrong with child sex. And it's kind of interesting that he has sex with his so-called girlfriend's daughter and she grows up and then he marries uh, his so-called girlfriend's daughter uh, and it was Roman Polanski made a comment to Woody Allen, dude, you're not helping me. So it was kind of a side thing that maybe was not all that helpful. Now, as far as backlash, many, many women's group rape groups came out opposed to any deal uh, being made uh, for Roman Polanski. And it basically, the, in Switzerland, it came down to this. Um, they were complaining that when I was in charge of uh, extradition, I did not pursue him. But that wasn't true. I tried to pursue him. Whenever I heard that he was trying to go out of the country, meaning out of France or um, out of Poland, I tried to get that, those countries uh, to go after him. But the thing was, he always stayed one step ahead of us and I was never able to get him. Now as far as Switzerland, they said, look, you know, he has to be able to be charged with something where he could spend more than six months incarcerated. 
Now, we had a situation that did not indicate what his sentence was going to be because he never finished the time uh, he was never sentenced. So then they said, well, okay, why don't you sentence him in absentia? And then if it's less than six months, then we, you know, we aren't going to bring him back or allow him to be extradited. So what happened is that he was arrested and this is where he was uh, under house arrest. This was his cabin that he stayed at uh, during the winter time, during the summer time. But the Swiss authorities did something interesting. Obviously, they got tired of this extradition and they claimed that they needed a transcript. There was a transcript that they needed and they s said, okay, we're going to dismiss it because we didn't get the transcript. What was interesting, they had the transcript. It was in the packet that was given to them originally. So they made the excuse, they released him, and that seemed to be the end of it. Now, again, we tried to go after Poland. And in, uh, in 2015, uh, we put a request in, and the judge over there said, oh, this is just too old. You know, we're not going to extradite him and send him back to the United States. So now he's clear of uh, France, uh, Switzerland, and uh, Poland. So anyway, a lot of people, especially in the media, want to make the judge out as the villain. That, you know, if he, uh, you know, hadn't have made some comments, you know, maybe uh, Polanski would not have run. He would not have become a fugitive. And then the DA's office under a new prosecutor, uh, Gascon, is releasing uh, the transcript of the DA who was in charge of it. Well, okay, the case goes on and on and on. It looks like it's never going to come to an end. Look at all the lives that have been affected by that one photo shoot back in 1977. A lot of lives have been affected and a lot of tragedy, unfortunately, for the victim as well as uh, Polanski. Some of the unanswered questions, should that be a crime? Uh, when you do sexual acts on a 13 year old girl, in many countries that's not a crime, uh, but it is in the United States and in California. Then if it is a crime, what would be the proper sentence in a case when you're having sexual relations with a 13 year old girl? Now, should you consider in the sentencing the accomplishments of the suspect, like Roman Polanski, and all the movies he's made, and all the things that he's accomplished in that? And then the other question is, should you consider the victim's uh, beliefs and uh, all? Here, the victim, after she got a, a settlement, maybe uh, $700,000, she no longer wanted uh, charges to be brought against uh, um, Roman Polanski, and especially as far as extraditing him. So that should that be taken in consideration. And then there's the other thing. When a person runs from uh, the court, should that be weighed as a negative against him, or should that be forgiven? Well, if you forgave it, then everybody would become a fugitive because that would mean nothing could happen to them. So what do we have here? We have a person who likes very young girls. You know, our model was 13 year old, Barbara Lass. She was 15 years old. And then there's another young lady, a number of them. One is Charlotte Lewis. And she claims that she was raped by Polanski when she was 16 years old. Uh, many other women have claimed uh, when they were very young that he took advantage of them. And it's just interesting that his wife now uh, was younger. True, she was 23. There's 33 years difference in their ages. But Roman Polanski, for some reason, likes younger women, some very young. Well, we have the Roman Polanski dilemma. Should we protect young girls from predators? Well, some countries say yes, some countries say no. The other is, has he paid enough? He did 47 days. He was under house arrest uh, in his Swiss chalet. 
uh, for like six months. You know, has he paid enough? Uh, and then there's uh, other people who feel, can't we just finally work this out somehow and forget that it happened? So that is the Polanski dilemma. Will it ever be resolved? Most likely not. Well, you decide what the proper answer to that question should be. Well, hopefully you found this Roman Polanski episode interesting. It certainly has a lot of issues, uh, certainly very controversial. Hopefully you'll join us again for another True Crime Files of Los Angeles when we discuss another case. See you then.